if the electro weak sector you know violates parity as we know it does uh, then if gravity becomes unified with the electro weak sector then it's almost unavoidable that gravity will have some chirality and i guess this is characterized by this imarizzi parameter etc can you say more has your thinking on that evolved that was one of the most you know kind of uh you know earth shattering bombshells that i ever heard because it meant that in my field we might see bigger chiral anomalies in the cosmic microwave background that might illuminate physics beyond the standard model indicative of Lorentz invariance violation, which is more startling to me than inflation. I don't know if I have anything new to say. I'm very grateful for your interest and other observers who t- who has taken these things seriously enough to really look for them. Here's something which is which fascinates me. General relativity and I'm not assuming that our listeners, your listeners, are experts in physics, but general relativity has a reputation of being difficult, partly because the Einstein equation is really complicated. And it's a function of this thing, the metric that measures distances, but you've got the inverse of the metric and the determinant of the metric and the square root of the metric and the square root of the determinant of the metric. And it's it's a mess to compute with, and it's sure a mess to make quantum mechanical. So what Abai used turned out we didn't he didn't know that we didn't know that at the time, but a Polish um, physicist who was a refugee to Mexico named Klebanski had discovered something wonderful, which is that. You can look at the Einstein equations in, from a kind of different point of view, which is chiral. That is where you only focus on how the left-handed neutrinos are re- react to a gravitational wave, and not the right-handed neutrinos. And if you do that, you get equations which are just quadratic equations, period. There's no determinants, there's no square roots, there's no inverses, there's just quadratic equations. And if something were simpler than that, it would be linear, and then we would linear, all linear equations we can solve. So it's as simple as it can get while still being non-trivial. And loop quantum gravity, the reason why all those ideas worked is because Abai rediscovered Fabianski's formulation. So now, so that makes me wonder, um, does nature know about this? Mm. And uh, so, for example, Roger Penrose's great construction, I mean, he's done so many great things, but the greatest, in my opinion, is twister theory, which has found a lot of use in particle physics and string theory and quantum gravity, but of its own is a very radical idea. And twister theory has this chirality built into it. The left-handed gravitational waves are described in a way that's different than the right-handed gravitational wave. Interesting. So that it was an earlier, yes, and you do speak about that in the book. And also, Roger's been a guest four times on the show as well. And his 90th birthday is coming up, and I'm delighted to be asked to speak on behalf of that uh, of that wonderful yes. occasion. Yeah. And uh, that will be something to celebrate in uh, in August, I believe, is his 90th birthday. It's quite amazing. And and thinking about his late great colleague, uh, Stephen Hawking, who uh, passed away three years ago, it's hard to believe. Uh, and this this notion that, you know, he kind of died without having unified, you know, quantum mechanics with gravity. I, I've been having this provocative statement, Lee, and at the risk of insulting my mentor, you know, Lee Smolin and, and friend. Um, I don't know that gravity has to be unified with with quantum mechanics. I mean, after all, there are only two situations, to my knowledge, at which the quantization of gravity, uh, the failure of gravity to play nice with quantum mechanics becomes important. And that's near singularity in a black hole Mm -hmm. and near the origin of the universe, if indeed it began with a singularity, which Sir Roger, as you know, does not believe it did, and Paul Steinhardt does not believe it did, and many others do not believe it did. Neil Turok, your colleague, does not believe it did. Um, And so there's one very questionable scenario that could get ticked off that we don't have to worry about quantum gravity in that scenario. And a black hole's, uh, you know, once beyond below the event horizon, as you know better than almost anybody else, uh, we we cannot observe 
the uh, the details, you know, what happens in in the singularity beyond, inside the event horizon stays inside the event horizon. So why do we care? I mean, would there be any signature of quantum gravity outside the event horizon? And that would be the only, or are there other scenarios in addition to physics beyond the event horizon that is relevant to the uh, the mandate that we must quantize gravity? Very good. So I'm going to give you another reason. I mean, I'm very interested in the idea of quantum gravity. And I don't think there's an open and shut case that we shouldn't quantize it. But here's something I've been fascinated by since graduate school days. And in I'll, I'll tell the background. In graduate school days, um, I got interested in Einstein. I was always interested in Einstein. And I had a friend who was a historian of physics, Amelia Rochelle Cohn. And she made a proposal to me. She said, why don't we read all of Einstein's papers from the beginning, at least the first 10 years or so? And very few of them were in English, except the three or four classics. But why don't we start with his very first paper, which was on thermodynamics and light, and read with her translating and read forward. And so we did that. And there was a thing that was very apparent as we did that, which is that he was enormously interested in the consequences of applying thermodynamic ideas to life. Mm. And therefore, he was very interested in the situation which is called the ultraviolet catastrophe, where if you make a box with conductors, and you must, you must actually know how to do this um, yeah. in your life, and you put some light, you have a little hole and you put some light in and you close the hole, the light bounces around. It doesn't interact with itself, but it interacts with the walls where the conductors are, and it thermalizes itself. It bounces and bounces and bounces and bounces and thermalizes itself. And then you open a little hole and you put a spectrograph there and it comes out the black body spectrum. Mm -hmm. And that was really interesting for Einstein because the black body spectrum, without even having the form of the spectrum, although he did actually, of course, this was after Planck, so he knew Planck's guess. And it was obvious that classical physics couldn't explain the fall off at the high frequency end. Mm -hmm. the, the e to the minus h bar omega over the temperature, basically. And, um, and this was a reason why you had to quantize electromagnetism, was to prevent that um, spectrum from just going out unstably to infinity. And so we read that in several different versions, and I thought, I wonder if you could make gravity waves do that. Mm. That is, mm -hmm. if you could make gravity waves, put them in a box, and force them into a catastrophe, which you had to save by saying there were gravitons. And then the H bar omega was the energy applied to gravity as well, to gravitational waves as well. And you know what? You can't do it. 